Go ahead, uh, grab your Bibles, open up to Genesis chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a black one there in the pew in front of you. Uh, and what page it's on is in the bulletin as well then. Genesis chapter 12. Now we are kicking off a new series this morning uh, in Genesis, but kind of the second part of Genesis where we're going to look at uh, Abraham's story, the life and legacy of Abraham. Now Abraham is one of the most important figures in human history. Just to put it in some perspective, perspective, a majority of humanity considers Abraham their spiritual father. Jews, Christians, Muslims alike. So a majority of humanity looks to Abraham in some way, which means it's safe to say that if you don't understand Abraham, you really can't understand human history. I mean, that's the, the level of importance here attached to his life and why it matters that we look at his life today. Uh, here's the difference, though, because I think you could say um, you can't really understand history without understanding, like, Lenin or something as well. Uh, but here's the distinction, is that uh, Abraham's story is not just our history, but in many ways parallels our individual stories as well. That is, Abraham uh, and we share certain commonality. We, we, we've got some overlap in key ways that I want to look at this morning. Abraham is in some ways a, a prototype of humanity, and so we want to look at him for that reason. Now, we are starting in Genesis 12, which means we're starting uh, kind of in the middle of the story. We covered Genesis 1 to 11 last fall, and so if you weren't with us last fall, uh, this is tough. This is like picking up with Lord of the Rings Two Towers, and you missed the first movie, and you're going to be just a little bit confused the whole time. And so let me briefly recap what we did last fall. We saw really two themes that kept emerging in these first 11 chapters, this, this tension almost. On the one hand, you have humanity's overwhelming propensity to mess things up, which we've continued in today. We're really good at this. The Bible calls it sin, right? And that's what we're talking about here. So you got that on the one hand, and then on the other hand, you've got God's unrelenting grace in the midst of it all. And those are the, the themes that start to emerge. In fact, uh, virtually all of the notes that will be struck in the rest of this book, not just talking Genesis, but Genesis through to Revelation, are introduced in those first 11 chapters. It's like a symphony. You know, a good composer will introduce all the themes and motifs in the opening movement, and that's exactly what God has done here because he's a masterful composer, and so his book is well-written, and, and here's some of them that emerge. Of course, we have creation, such an important piece, but then leading quickly into the fall, uh, humanity's rebellion against God, our desire to be God and to kind of kick him off the throne, put ourselves on the throne of our own lives, followed then quickly by judgment with the flood, God's wrath, his just anger at our sin. But even that is mingled with grace and that God rescues Noah and his family to, to recreate, to, to launch a new humanity as it were. And then all of that culminates where we left off last fall was in Genesis chapter 11 and the Tower of Babel. And what happens in Babel is you get a group of people together who decide that apart from God, they can still do everything. They have no need of God. If humanity just would come together and work together, they would be fine. So we see this humanistic self-reliance coming out, just proof, by the way, that the more things change, the more they stay the same. It's exactly where we are today, how I would describe pretty much every culture that's ever, ever existed. We have this sense of we can, we can do it on our own. So that's where we ended last November, and you can see that we're at a bit of a spiritual impasse. Like things are not going well for humanity. I could tease it out a little bit more even. Uh, humanity kept dividing into sort of two tracks. It happens almost immediately. You get Cain who murders his brother. They're not doing so well. This is humanity in rebellion against God. And then you've got Seth, the the, the 
brother who's born now that Abel's dead, and Seth calls on the name of the Lord. And then even within Seth's line, we, we see a split again. And so we have, uh, on the one hand, Ham, for example, father of Canaan, which is gonna continue in rebellion against God, and then you have Shem, as in the Semites. And so the Jewish people are gonna come from the line of Shem. All right, so we, we seem to still have this one line, uh, not so much a fan of God, and one line tracking with God here, <laughs> except that then we get to the end of chapter 11 and the wheels come off. Because we get to Terah, Abraham's father. So if you're looking up just a little bit on your page, 11, 27 to 32, we get a little bit of Terah's story here. I'm not gonna read it, but um, if you were an original reader of this text, you would notice trouble is brewing here immediately just when it mentions the name Terah. Because Terah means moon. And Terah lives in Ur, which is the center of moon worship. So it's this pagan cult there in Ur. In fact, they ha- they've excavated Ur. This is a real place. We're dealing in historical facts here. And so they've excavated Ur. There's a giant tower there, a lot like the Tower of Babel, dedicated to worshiping the moon. Elements of um, traces of human sacrifice present around this and whatnot. So I mean, this is a, a dark place, a dark place. And this is where the line of Shem has, has ended. The Joshua 24, verse two, this is at the end of Joshua's life. Uh, this is when Israel's come into the promised land, but he's summing up some of Israel's history, and he says, long ago your ancestors, including Terah, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshiped other gods. So now we seem to have nobody left in humanity calling on the name of the one true God. Now, we're still reading in 11. You'd see that they do actually set out, Terah and his family, they set out from Ur, and they're headed towards Canaan. Stephen tells us in Acts chapter 7 that Abraham first heard the call of God somewhere in Ur. And so they they seem like maybe they're making progress, except it says they stopped in Haran. Haran is another center of moon worship. And dad, Terah, at that point says, you know what, this is far enough. I'm not, I, I still recognize this place. There's still parts of this culture that make sense to me. We're staying here. I'm not going any further. And Abraham stays as well. So there you are. Humanity's at a spiritual dead end at this point. Even the godly line of Seth, the godly line of Shem, is now enmeshed in paganism. And it, we, maybe we got some hope for Abraham. He seems to have heard the call of God. Hey, it's still a dead end, though, because Abraham's childless. And his wife is barren. There's no hope for children either. So this is it. This is the end of humanity. And as I mentioned, the, the story of humanity, the Abraham's story here is, is really every individual's story as well because this is precisely where we find ourselves. We are spiritually dead. This is where we all start. We're gonna see we're all enmeshed in paganism ourselves as we keep going. And so the only hope we possibly have is for God to do something in the midst of this, to respond to the call of God. God needs to speak, and that's where we pick up this morning, the call of God. We're gonna see that it's a call to surrender, a call to purpose, and a a call to respond. And so uh, that'll be our outline this morning. Let's start with the first part here, the call to surrender. I'm just gonna read verse one for now. Genesis chapter 12, verse one. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. So nothing surprising here. Because humanity is dead spiritually, the story has to begin with God speaking. The call of God is absolutely necessary. Because unless God speaks, we will remain stuck spiritually. And as I said, this is not just something that needs to happen for humanity as a whole, but something that needs to happen individually as well. And I do mean individually. You can't be grandfathered into the call. Uh, you know, you get children grow up in the church, something like that. I mean, some of you maybe have been uh, grown up in, in church, maybe even grew up in this church. And that's, that's fine and all that, but unless God speaks and you respond directly to that call, look, you may be nice, You may be moral or good. Uh, You may be a church going even, but you're not alive. Not spiritually alive. And that's the the first song we sang, right? I I gotta personally run out of the tomb that is my spiritual death, where I begin. 
So you can't be grandfathered into the call. You can't ride someone else's coattails into the kingdom. There's no such thing as a, a cultural Christian, let's say. I'll give you a story that <laughs> illustrates this some. So a, a pastor that I know of in Texas was uh, having a conversation with a person at one point, and the guy kept claiming to be a Christian, and, and the evidence of his life was against that claim. And so the pastor finally said, how do you know you're a Christian? And the guy looked at him like he was speaking gibberish, and he goes, because I was born in Texas. <laughs> That's where some of us are though we have this sense of yeah i'm from texas of course I'm a, i grew up in church of course i'm a christian not how it works well i'm an irish so i'm catholic you know i mean that's just and, and what we're hearing here is no that, that's not it this is an individual response to an individual call now you may ask then at this point <laughs> How do I hear God speaking today? Then this feels important. How do I know if he is speaking? What if he doesn't call? Let me answer it in this way by saying the fact that you're here this morning is proof that God is still speaking and speaking to you directly. God is calling you. He may speak through his word as we unpack it this morning. Uh, He may speak through a friend. Perhaps you're here because somebody invited you to church. That person is... God calling you through somebody it may come in much subtler ways as well, though. Sometimes this happens where your conscience is, is pricked all of a sudden. Uh, one of those gray areas of your life that you've always known about, uh, it starts to feel a lot darker than it did before. You're going, I'm not sure I can keep going with this. That, that's the call of God working on your heart. Or maybe even more common would be this, is that just a, a lack of satisfaction. You just reach a point in your life where you go, is, is there more? Is there more than this? I, and I think that that last one, that lack of, of satisfaction is, is the prevalent one today because of our culture, because our culture, and we have everything, don't we? We just have everything. There's like no excuses here. So this is how it works. At some point in your life, you have a picture of what you think your life is going to be. And it you know, maybe looks different for most people, but let's, let's give the, the typical version of this. Married, 2.2 kids or whatever it is, dog, white picket fence, the house, you know, the whole American dream. And uh, some of us will end up there. We're going we're gonna to actually have that. And so you, you've got it all. You're, you're making the money you think you should be making. You've got the house. You've got the wife or, or husband. You've got the kids and all of that. But you, you wake up one day and you go, <laughs> there must be more. Like, this isn't what, this is what a midlife crisis is, isn't it? I mean, when does a midlife crisis happen? It happens when you reach the point that you, it was the destination in your mind. This is where I was headed. This is what I wanted my life to be. And now that I'm here, I think I need a sports car too. All right, I mean, but that's how it works. There's that sense of there must be something more. That's God speaking. That's God speaking. That's God saying, yes, you're right. There is something more. What you have isn't enough. And you're looking in the wrong places. Honestly, another life is possible in this world, which we'll come back to in a little bit. So God speaks, but what is the call precisely? What is the nature of the call that we are hearing? You get it right there. You know, go from your country, your people, your father's household. It is a call to surrender. It is a call to surrender, to to yield control of your life, which will mean, of course, a certain amount of separation from a former way of life, which is why Abraham is being called out of his country. That's what it says, go from your country. In fact, in Hebrew, it's kind of an odd phrase. There's like an extra you in there. So it's like you, get yourself out of this country, which makes sense because he's talking to Abraham because dad's staying put. Tara's not budging. And so he's got to say, look, I understand that there are things that you're going to be leaving then, but you need to surrender. You need to respond to this call right here. And uh, just a monumental act of faith when Abraham responds, as we'll see. I mean, uh, we, we have to understand what's going on here. So he's a pagan, which means that's his religion. This is what he knows, and there's comfort in the religion which you grew up in, of course. So here he's a pagan. He's advanced in years, so not exactly in that, you know what, I'm going on an adventure, let's do this, stage of life. 
And he's also leaving his land because he's, he's settled on a land. And that doesn't mean much to us today. Like We will fly across the country, move across the country, no problem. Some of you are probably not from Chicago and yet you live here now. Well, why not? We're not tied to land. And we can FaceTime our family back home. It is no big deal. But back then, your land was your security and your prosperity. This is where the money came from. You walk away from that, you're starting from scratch. You don't have a government program as a safety net. The safety net you had was the fact that you lived in the same town as your family and they would take care of you. And God says to Abraham, yeah, all that, walk away. Walk away from it. Monumental act of faith. On the basis of, of that call alone, hearing the word of God alone, Abraham obeys and risks everything. This is the hard part of the sermon, right? I mean, this is, this is the part we don't really like. Who likes surrender? I mean, who wants to go, yeah, that's what I signed up for? What exactly are we surrendering anyway? And here I want to get into paganism a little bit. We have to understand paganism to understand what's going on here. Because you're, you're coming into this going, I don't worship the moon, so I don't see what this has to do with me. All right, so let's, let's tease it out some. Because paganism at its core is not about the moon or the sun or the, whatever it is you're worshiping. Paganism at its core is about control. It's about control. Because here's how paganism works. If I do this, if I make this sacrifice, if I perform this religious ritual, then the God I'm worshiping is obligated to me. I do this, he's got to respond with some good rain so that I get some good crops. So you can see that paganism is inherently selfish. It's a quid pro quo religion. All right, I'm going to scratch your back, you've got to scratch mine in return. So I'm still in control. Really, I'm, I'm still God. I'm, I'm still the one making the decisions for my existence. So they would worship idols in order to remain in control of their destiny. And again, that's what it means to be God of your own life right there. So we're right back in Eden. We're right back to, you know what? If I eat this apple, if I do what God says not to do, then I get to be God. I'm gonna know, I'm gonna get to make my own decisions about good and evil. That sounds awesome. That's the kind of control I want. And that's what we have here. Well, now we start to see that, <laughs> that at heart, we're all pagans. And call it whatever you like, I don't care, but it's paganism at its core. This is who we are. We worship idols, false gods. Now, they're not usually carved out of stone today. There's things like sex or money or power, approval, you know, take your pick, something like that. We worship idols in order to control our destiny. In order to control our destiny. So, uh, I'd say even more than in destiny, in some ways, it's, it's a lot of ways it's controlling our identity, it's creating the facade of this is who I want to be. This is who I think I am. You know, it's not usually about the sex or the money. It's about what the sex or the money says about me. If I can get all these girls to sleep with me, what does that say about me? Or if my career is taken off like this, I'm making this much money, what does that say about me? I, mean, I, I, I must be okay then. That's what we're doing here. It, it's like Babel. So again, if you were here last year, we talked about this, Genesis 11. If not, they, they build the, the tower and all of that. Why? Chapter 11, verse 4, it says this, you know, let's build ourselves a tower so that we may make a name for ourselves. There's the motivation. I want to make a name for myself. I want, to, I want to be somebody. I want people to know who I am based on the control I've taken of my own destiny. In other words, this whole religious enterprise that they're embarking on is just a massive PR campaign. And it's the same PR campaign that we're all involved in. You don't believe me, just flip open social media. I don't care which platform you're on. Just go to any one of them. Tell me we're not all on a massive PR campaign. This is what we're about. Do you see what kind of spouse I am? I mean, look at the date I just took my wife on. Look at the craft we made with our kids. I'm super mom. Look at the advancement I've got in my career. Look at the run I just went on and how fast I am. I'm an athlete. I'm in good shape. Or look at the cause I've taken up, how passionate I am about justice. Do you see who I am? We're about our own identity. We're on this, making a name for ourselves. The problem is it doesn't work. That's the problem. It just doesn't work. You're not fooling anybody and lie to everybody else, but you're ultimately just trying to lie to yourself. It leads to this lack of satisfaction. It never is enough. Trying to give yourself an identity never works. It doesn't, it doesn't, 
It doesn't give you what you're really longing for. I mean, you can take all the pictures you want of your dates and stuff like that, put your engagement pictures up on Facebook, and marriages still fail because romance isn't enough. Or you, you get the, 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 I mean, money. <laughs> Let me tell you this. Have you ever seen a movie where at the end of the story, the moral was, I should have spent less time with my family so that I could have made a little extra money? No. Yeah, because money never works. That's not gonna bring any, so... So you've got not only this lack of satisfaction, but you, you've got to couple that with the, the crushing burden of trying to create this identity for yourself, make a name for yourself, and it's this house of cards that's knocked down by the first stiff breeze of circumstances that blows your way. Look, if you're depending on your career advancement, you know, look, I was producer and now I'm executive producer. Or I was a VP, now I'm a P. Like, look, I'm making it. I'm making it in the world. And the economy tanks and you lose your job. Now who are you? You see what I mean? It's a house of cards. It doesn't work. So the call to surrender is just a call to give up the fruitless, selfish endeavor to quit trying to be God and let God be God. And let me just draw out one more additional element just because that was bad enough and it gets worse, okay? So here it is. You'll notice at the end he says, to the land I will show you. Go to the land, I'm not gonna tell you what land. Don't worry about that. I'll show you when we get there, okay? So God doesn't tell him where he's going. You're gonna get the destination later. You know what that means? The call to surrender is a surrender of self-determination. And that is by far the hardest part. I'm not in control of my steps anymore. I want, you know, if you give me the map and show me the destination, then I'll decide if I want to go there or not. And God says, no. You wanna know why? Because you're still trying to be God then. You're still saying, I'm gonna choose the destination. You're gonna let me be God. Here's how it works. Just take a step in the direction I point you and we'll see where you end up. This is how it works out today and you may be in this place where there's this sense of if I become a Christian, does that mean that I'm gonna have to fill in the blank? Whatever it is. I'm gonna have to give up this element of my lifestyle. I'm gonna have to, uh, I'm gonna, whatever it is. And that's where God says, that's not the question. That's not the question to be asking at this point. Just don't worry about the destination. Answer the call first. The call to surrender. Second part of this then, though. Once we call to surrender, we're going to find that it is a call to purpose, a new purpose as well. So let me read verses 2 and 3. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All right, did you catch the massive shift that happens when we surrender to the call? We go from the Tower of Babel, come, let's make a name for ourselves to God saying to Abraham, I will make your name great. So it's a shift now from a, a created identity. I'm going to try and create my own facade here to a, a given identity. And this is a, a huge shift. So let's tease it out a bit here. So we have the call to surrender, which we could sum it up. It's sort of this, leave and believe. I mean, that's the call to surrender. Leave your rebellious ways. You're trying to be God of your own life and believe in God instead. So it feels like we're giving up a ton here, but in return, you read verses two and three and you see what God gives in response, the riches of grace. So you move from giving up what feels like everything to discovering that you really gave up nothing and have received more than everything in return. That's what happens. That's the, the another type of life possible in this world moment. Here it is. It's one free from the fruitless search for self-satisfaction. But it doesn't mean that the satisfaction is gone. God offers us what we seek, but offers in, in a different way. It, so Abraham, for example, he gives up the security of his former way of life, the land, the family around him. But he is given a new security, and it's far more secure, because God says, I'm going with you. That's real security. Even if it doesn't always feel that way, it's a much more lasting security. We give up our quest for identity, but are given, in exchange, a new, untouchable identity one that circumstances of life can't shake. So you move from the security of your 401k, let's say, 
I mean, this is, this is how I know my life's gonna be okay. Again, I'm in control of my destiny. Look at the figure in my retirement account. I'm going to be okay. All it takes is a stock market crash, right? Like history tells us that's, that's not good enough right there. So you move from that false security to a real security. We have an, a guaranteed inheritance kept in heaven for you. I mean, no stock, stock market crash is gonna touch that, right? Or you move from, uh, let's say, a peace that is dependent on circumstances. That's the peace most of us are seeking for. The absence of conflict. We just want smooth sailing, you know? So try not to make waves kind of thing. Hope nothing goes wrong, fingers crossed. You move from a peace like that to a peace that is unaffected by circumstances. No matter what storm comes, there's a peace in the midst of it. Makes me think of um, Eric Little, famous runner, Chariots of Fire, is about him, right? So that's what we know him for. Devout Christian, wouldn't run on Sunday, that's why they made the movie and all that. And he, if you pay attention to the movie, he mentions the fact that he's going to China at some point, and he went to China then at some point, was a missionary there after his racing career. Well, then the Chinese at a certain point in history decided they were not fans of foreigners anymore, and so they rounded up a good number of them and put them in prison camps, basically, and Eric Little was one of them, and eventually died in that camp, in fact. There were people in that camp who were converted simply by his lifestyle. They looked at him, they looked around, you know, there's a shortage of food, shortage of water, shortage of space, everybody's selfishly bickering, and then you have Eric Little off to the side absolutely devoted to sacrificial love. And there are people who were marked eternally by that example. Why? Because he had this peace that was unaffected by (laughs) terrible, terrible circumstances. Now let's take one more example. We move from trying to earn love selfishly This is unfortunately how love works. Love has this great selfless sound to it, but most of our love is to try and get something from the other person. Like we go into marriage going, I love you because I love how you make me feel about myself. And so long as you continue to make me feel that way about myself, we're gonna have a good thing going. And if that stops, we're gonna have to reconsider. So, so the whole love relationship is entirely selfish. And we could, that's not just marriage, that's friendship, that's parenting. That's, you can take a, a whatever example you want. Well, we move from that, trying to earn love, to all right, you've been given an unearned and undeserved love, which means your cup is always brimful and actually overflowing so that you can love regardless of what the other person is giving you, which is now true love. Actually, outward-focused love frees us to do that. And that's why I say that this is a call to, to purpose. To purpose. We, the purpose is to become outward-focused, to be a blessing to others what God says to Abraham. So I'm gonna bless you, but I'm gonna bless you so that you become a blessing to other people. When we respond to God's call, he repurposes our lives so that we are freed to live beyond ourselves. No longer trying to create our own identity, right? That's all taken care of so I can now actually live for others, live for God, and as a result, live for others. If you try to create an identity, your life is always going to be self-centered. Like you're gonna try and earn love selfishly or your career is gonna be about you, all that kind of stuff. But if your identity is given to you and it's untouchable, it's unchanging, it's unconditional, now that's different. You can truly love others. You can be a blessing to others. Let me give you an example here. So I have a family member who's a banker, business banker of some sort. I hope I get this right, because he's here. So if I mess this up, it's gonna go badly. But here's the thing, so he doesn't work on commission, which always surprises people, because he's effectively in a sales job. So uh, think about what that does, though. It means he, as he meets with these small business owners and stuff, he can offer them what they actually need. Right? There's no desire to upsell or anything like that. There's no incentive to be selfish, because the salary is taken care of, so he can actually serve his customers. Make sure they get what they really need. Now take that and apply it, I mean, to the whole of your life almost. (laughs) Take that certainly to your vocation. I mean, whatever it is that you're doing, where you're going, you know what, it's fine. Like, what I need is taken care of, and so I can be about 
others. That's the difference that we have here. When we surrender to God, we're given this purpose and used by God then to bring blessing to others. Again, feeling like this is a good thing. This is something we would want. So last question is how do we get there? Last section, the call to respond. Let me read verses four to nine, the longest uh, bit of text. It'll be our shortest section though. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. So Abraham here uh, models the response to which we're called. If you're confused, by the way, the fact that he's Abram here, uh, he's gonna be Abraham later. We'll get there in a few weeks. I'll explain it more, but it's not much of a shift. Abram, that means my father is great. Abraham means the father of many. So it's sort of like Abram means daddy and Abraham means big daddy. So that's, that's the only difference you got here. That's not original. I can't take credit for that. I heard somebody else say that, but... So Abraham models this response to which we're called, which is a faith expressed in obedience and worship. I mean, obedience. So Abram went. Remember that whole, you see what you're leaving behind and still he goes. And it's, it's faith in just the bare word of God at this point. He has nothing else that he's going on other than God spoke. There's no promise fulfilled first in his life before the leave and believe moment. So we see there's the the repentance and that he walks away from his former life and there's the obedience living this new sort of life and they both spring from faith in the word of God. And so does worship. You see that in verse seven, right? He builds an altar there to the Lord, does it again in verse eight in a different place. So he builds this place of worship, what? In response to God speaking. It's the response of faith. In fact, there's this interesting contrast between verses seven and verse eight. So in verse seven, it says he built an altar. And then in verse eight, it says he pitched his tent. That's a great contrast right there. He built an altar, but just pitched a tent. So there's this permanence attached to his worship because he knows that that's eternal. And then when it comes to his life, there's this recognition of the impermanence of it all. He's willing to be a a pilgrim, a wanderer in this life. Hebrews 11, 9, and 10, which is talking about the story, draws this out a little bit. It'll be up on the screen for you. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says. By faith, he, Abraham, made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. So he's happy to see himself as a pilgrim, to live in tents because he's looking forward to a city with foundations. I love that phrase, a city with foundations. In other words, a a city that's built to last, where there will be lasting security, lasting peace, lasting satisfaction. So Abraham in building an altar, but but just pitching a tent, he's acknowledging that the world is less than ultimate and the ultimate satisfaction that he seeks won't be found in this world. And we struggle with this today. We struggle with this today. It's so tough to trust in the bare word of God because this world feels so ultimate. I mean, it's, it's, it's physical, it's tangible. You can touch this world, the supernatural world. It's above the physical, the natural. And so it's harder to get our hands around not the first people to struggle with it. In fact, in Hebrews, a guy goes on a few verses later and, and, and shares that struggle precisely. He says this, this is verses 15 and 16. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, 
a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Interesting, that's in the perfect tense. Has prepared. It's already ready. It is more real than anything in this world, even though we can't see it yet. So let me speak frankly for a moment. And just to kind of acknowledge the like, elephant in the room here, I mean, what would keep us from this type of surrender? It, it's, it's the question of the cities, isn't it? The, the, what'll keep us from this sort of response to the call of God is either not thinking that the former city was that bad or not thinking that the city to come is that good. I mean, that's what will keep us from it. Still looking to this world, that former way of life, the former city, to provide ultimate satisfaction because we don't think the heavenly city exists and so possibly look for satisfaction there. This is the response of faith. And this is the, the, the sense of I'm, I'm trusting in the reality of the heavenly city. And so we have to reckon honestly with the old country. And what I mean by reckon honestly is look at it and go, lasting satisfaction will not be found there which will then lead us to think deeply about the city to come and whether or not satisfaction actually could be found there. C.S. Lewis, in one of my favorite quotes, he says this. He says, if I find in myself a longing which nothing in this world can satisfy, then the most logical explanation is that I was made for another world. And that's it. That's the heavenly city right there. Still longing for a satisfaction that this world cannot provide. Maybe there's another world. Maybe that's why I haven't found satisfaction here yet. That's the attitude of faith. Last little section here, though. Let me just say it's, it's a faith based on more than what Abraham had. Abraham had the bare word of God. We have a little bit more. Let me explain. So Abraham lived this life of faith. You know, he, he shows us, models how to respond But but here's the faith component. God says, I'm gonna make you into a great nation. What do you need to be a nation? You need a land and a people. And Abraham's got neither of them at this point. And the people one especially looks pretty bad. He's got a barren wife who's post-menopausal. She's old and getting older. So where's the hope, right? And yet he lives in faith for 25 years waiting for the child of promise because verse seven, to your offspring, I will give this land. And he goes, okay, there's a promise. I'm gonna trust in this promise even though I don't know how it's going to come. Eventually, Isaac is born, this child of the promise that Abraham was living in faith waiting for. Here's the thing. Isaac is not that exciting. (laughs) Not much changes. He is not a great people at that point. It takes a long time after that. So Isaac is himself pointing to something else. You know, through your offspring, uh, to your offspring I will give this land. Well, Isaac isn't given the land. And what about the whole, I'm gonna bless all peoples through you. All peoples on earth, we bless, they weren't blessed through Isaac, I can tell you that. So that means that Isaac isn't really the child of promise. The Isaac is just a, a pointer to the greater than Isaac who would be coming. And he's born, this child of promise, in a stable in Bethlehem. And he's not only a greater than Isaac, he's a greater than Abraham too. I mean, look at, look at what made Abraham so great was that he left his father and he left his home to become a pilgrim in order that all peoples be blessed through him. But he left an earthly father and he left an earthly city. Jesus leaves heaven, the throne of glory, and the father with whom he has lived in perfect fellowship since before time to become a stranger and a pilgrim in our world, clothed in human frailty. And for what purpose? That all peoples could be blessed through him. What does he do? He lives the life we were supposed to live. That life of, I'm not gonna try to be God, I'm gonna let God be God. Perfect submission to his father. He lives that life. And then he dies the death that we deserve to die. The price of our rebellion against God, the price of our making ourselves like God when we are not, the just wrath that we deserve, he takes on himself. So we give him our sin, the punishment that we deserve. In exchange, he gives us the perfect record of his life and the welcome as a son, as a child in God's eyes. We learn something about the call when we think of it that way. I mentioned the fact that the call is necessary. It is necessary, but it's also gracious. I mean, that's the most incredible part of this call. Why is God calling us? 
And he calls Abraham, we think of Abraham as this great man of faith. When God calls Abraham, he's a pagan. He did not deserve God's call, and God called him still. That's the come as you are line that we sang in the offering. But you see then what I mean about it's not just faith in the bare word of God like Abraham had. Sure, we have faith in God's word, but we also can have faith in God's word made flesh, Jesus, who is the word of God. That is, we have not just faith in future promises, although we have that, we are still longing for the heavenly city, but we also have faith in historical realities, the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. We have faith in the finished work of Christ. That's the call that we respond to. So how will you respond? This last section I just want to offer primarily to those of you who are here this morning who are not sure about where you stand on this whole Jesus question. You're here and skeptical uh, about uh, some of what we've been talking about. If you're here this morning and, and you put your faith in Christ, then, I mean, this is our story. We know that. We've had the same call. We, we can look back to that moment when that's happened. We can see the response that we have to God's incredible grace. Certainly doesn't mean we're perfect. So if you're here and you know one of these people who's responded to this call and you're looking at their life going, yeah, that's right. We're still sinners, still struggle with it. That whole opportunity to return to the former city thing, that's, that happens a lot. We don't want to move back there, but just a weekend getaway every now and again is great, you know? And so sure, look to Christ. Don't look to us to be very clear. But, but let me, again, address the skeptics primarily here. You may not know the final destination. In fact, you will not know the final destination. But still, take a step. If you hear God speaking, take a step. Take a, a first step at least. He knows where you're going. What does that first step look like? I don't know. It could be different things. Finish out the series with us. Okay, Abraham's got an interesting life. You're going to want to track with him through the rest of it. Why don't you come in the next few months and, and, and listen with us? You don't like this church? And the preacher's lousy? That's fine. I get that, okay? Find a good Bible-believing church. I, I will give you recommendations. There are a lot of good churches around here. We're on the same team. We're not in competition. I'd be happy to direct you. You don't want to step foot in church again like you did your once this year and it's about a year before you're going to go back to church? Fine. Let me direct you to some online resources. It's the beauty of the internet is there are a lot of very good preachers who are available for free online. I'll direct you to some of them. Or maybe you got questions and you just need to continue the conversation. Maybe somebody brought you here this morning, have a conversation with them. I'm sure they're eager to have it. If not, shoot me an email, grab me after the service. I'm always happy to talk. I'll take you out, my treat. This is anytime, always available. We've been talking a lot too about um, sort of the, the emotional sense that Christianity makes, that lack of satisfaction. We have not talked about the intellectual sense that Christianity makes. And so you may have some of those stumbling blocks and you need to walk through some of that. Again, we are available. We can either direct you to a book if you're a reader, or you want to just sit down and have a conversation. I mean, what, let's talk about what I said, the historical reality of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Let's talk about whether it it's real <laughs> or not. Take a step. Ultimately, the step that you're taking is to respond to the offer of grace in faith, believing in a city with foundations, blessed to be a blessing to others. Let me pray for us, and we'll continue in worship. Lord, we know that you are still speaking today. We are confident of that fact, if nothing else. Speak clearly to us, Bring us to a place of response, Lord. Whatever that first step is for every one of us here in response to your word this morning, give us the courage, Lord, the faith that Abraham had to step out in obedience and ultimately in worship. We ask through Christ our Lord, amen.